Stripping Down Science. The Naked Scientists. Hello, it's Chris Smith here, and joined by Kat Arney this week. Hello. And we're talking about the science of the sun, the science of nuclear power and nuclear fusion, which is, of course, the thing that powers the sun, and also how to get the perfect suntan. If you'd like to join in tonight's discussion on any of those topics, then call now, 08459 25 2000 is the phone number, email chris at nakedscientist.com, or send us a text on 07786 20 And coming up on the show later, we're going to be hearing about how your home computer can help in the fight against malaria in Africa. Um, I'll be revealing scientists who've been scratching their heads for an unusual source of stem cells. Cells. And Chris will be telling us about uh, the world's smallest tweezers. Uh, but I don't know if he's been using them to pluck his eyebrows or not. Looking a bit bushy there, well, Chris. Good. Oh, you, you think I need a, a bit of plucking? Yeah, I could do a bit of, bit of atomic tweezering there. And also, we'll be hearing the sound of your brain. I can't wait to hear this. So uh, that's all coming up later on the show. But also, there's our quiz. Yep, there's our quiz, and you can win tons of prizes. Kat is from Cancer Research UK, and she's brought in because we're talking about the science of the sun and the science of sun tanning. And, in fact, quick question for you, Kat. Do you know what's the hottest bit of the sun? Uh, no. Page three. <laughs> uh, the, the prizes this week got some fantastic frisbees, hats and T-shirts. Everything's there in the bag to give away tons of stuff. All you have to do, give us a call, and you can take part. Uh, and, incidentally, um, tonight we're going to show you on Kitchen Science how sun cream works. Okay, So it's a fantastic experiment demonstrating the principles of sun cream. And uh, also, here's my quiz question for you this evening. How many legs has a squid got? Do you think you know the answer? If you do, get in touch. Here's how. Baffled by biology? Yep. Foxed by physics? Oh, yes. To get your question answered, call the Naked Scientist now on 08459 25 2000 or email chris at nakedscientist.com. Well, when your computer's not doing anything at home, you know, maybe you're checking your email or if it's just sitting there switched on, you could actually be helping scientists in the fight against malaria. Now, there's quite a variety of programmes now that people can download um, which can do sort of scientific searching uh, while your computer's not being used for anything else. For example, the famous SETI project looking for extraterrestrial life by getting people's computers to analyse signals from space telescopes. And there's programmes that can look to discover the structure of new drugs and things like that. But now there's the Africa at Home project, which is designed to, to model the way that malaria sweeps through Africa. And uh, this can help people, scientists, to understand how the disease spreads and then also ways that we can treat it. So you can get involved in this as well by going to the Africa at Home website, which is www.africaathome.org, and you can download the software. And when your computer's not doing anything better, it will, um, it will help in the fight against malaria, which I think is very important. We had um, a guy on not so long ago and we were talking about the science of weather forecasting and, and he was discussing the principles of predicting the weather and yeah. using powerful computers and computer models of climate and, and weather because they reckoned they could predict when it was going to rain and on the basis of rainfall prediction six months ahead where we were going to have bad hot spots of malaria and therefore where best to deploy resources. Yeah, because there's also a, a, the climate at home uh, things that you can look at, weather prediction as well that you can download but I think the malaria one's more worthwhile. Well, totally different subject, and that's uh, that researchers have made a staggering discovery this week, which is the discovery of the world's smallest pair of tweezers, or at least how to make them. Um, if you cast your mind back about 20-odd years, and uh, we have someone in the studio who I know is going to remember this, and that's Geoffrey Lewins from Cambridge University. <laughs> Geoffrey, do you remember um, IBM, about, I think it was about 20 years ago, wrote with an electron microscope in xenon atoms the letters I, B, M? Didn't they? Yes, they could actually place things in position at that molecular atomic level. It was tremendous. And at the time they said, this is going to revolutionise computing. Computing, perhaps. Quite a lot of other things in nanotechnology or even smaller. I can think of uh, the idea of little machines that actually go down your blood veins and deliver the aspirin exactly where it's needed instead of wasting it all over the rest of the body. But we're not quite there yet with that, are we? To pretty be honest. close, pretty close. But what these guys at the University of Bonn, led by a researcher called Arno Rausch and Beutel, have done is to make literally a pair of tweezers that can move individual atoms around using two laser beams. And the way it works is that you have a cloud of very cold cesium atoms. You have a laser beam which is set up and tuned to create what's called a standing wave. So if you imagine, when you shake something very, very fast, eventually you see a pattern 
of shaking in a rope, for instance, which looks like it's standing still. And so you do that with a laser beam. And when you shine that laser beam into the cloud of cesium atoms, they arrange themselves just at the tips of each of the laser waves. And if you use two of these lasers, one pointing horizontally and one pointing vertically, and then you pulse the laser, so that's the equivalent of giving your rope, which has got the standing wave on it, a bit of a shake, so the, the loop travels, you, you see the wave travel down. This turns your laser into a sort of conveyor belt, and all the cesium atoms at the tips of the waves then move along the conveyor, and with the vertical laser beam, you can pluck one or two of those atoms and move them up and downstairs too. So what the researchers reckon now is that they can position these atoms literally individually, almost anywhere, in three-dimensional space. And they're saying that this will lead to big breakthroughs in the world of, of quantum computing. Quantum computing, maybe even in medicine and uh, building new drugs. Potentially. I think it's amazing. You, you'd almost never believe it. Oh, it's incredible. Um, and now something that also may turn out to be a, a big, great benefit in the future is uh, some research that's been done at Pennsylvania School of Medicine, University of Pennsylvania, into stem cells. Now, stem, stem cells get people very excited because stem cells are cells found in the body that have the potential to become other sorts of cells. So um, when you're developing, um, you, you start life as one egg cell and you become a little ball of stem cells that then become everything in the human body. So those are very powerful stem cells. But also as adults, we have stem cells in our body. For example, in our gut, constantly making new gut tissue, or in our skin. Um, all the dust that's found around in your house is skin cells that have been shed, so we're constantly needing to make new skin. Um, 40,000 skin cells a minute, a minute yeah. you shed from your body. 40,000. I mean, if you add that up, it's a few stone. It's about five stone in dead skin in a lifetime. It's Gee, a huge amount. Good grief. Um, but so stem cells are very important in the adult body. Um, but also, potentially in the future, if we can work out how you can take stem cells from adults, from adult skin tissue, um, and then turn them into other sorts of cells, you could use them to repair damaged brains, for example, in people with things like Parkinson's or um, spinal cord tissue in people who've had injuries. And the researchers led by um, George Zhu have found that you can actually isolate these kind of stem cells from hair follicles. Now, obviously, your hair cells are growing all the time, so there must be stem cells there. But the researchers have managed to show that you can take these stem cells and turn them into other sorts of cells, which is the key thing. So not just hair, but you can actually make them uh, turn into nerve cells, muscle cells, and something called melanocytes. These are the pigment cells in the skin. So potentially... Very, very exciting stuff there because obviously there's lots of ethical problems with using stem cells from fetuses and embryos. But if we can just get them from easily harvested adult tissue, it could be a real breakthrough. Cure for baldness, though, Kat, potentially? Well, Chris, I don't know. You're looking fairly fluffy there. So, uh, um, I've got an email here from Erica Diazoni who says, uh, Hello, Naked Scientist. Greetings from Sally sunny California. I'm reading this because of, you're mentioning hair. Um, she says, I'd like to know if putting lemon juice on your hair really helps to bleach it. And if so, why? Thanks very much and keep up the great work. I adore your podcast. Erica, what do you reckon? Well, the answer to this is something called acid catalyzed oxidation, I found. Um, basically, if you uh, add oxygen and ultraviolet light to most carbon-based substances like hair or clothes, for example, um, they will bleach. So just over the summer, if you're out in the sun, uh, there's air, obviously, and sunlight. So your hair will get bleached, uh, the hair on your arms gets bleached, your clothes will get bleached a bit. And adding lemon juice to your hair, that's adding a very strong acid. Uh, it's the acid found in lemon juice, citric acid. And that just speeds up this bleaching process. Um, so that's what it does. It's acid in the lemon juice plus oxygen plus the ultraviolet light from the sun bleaches your hair. Now let's change the subject completely. I want you both to ha have a listen to this and, and see what you think of this. Any guesses, Geoffrey? Whistlers from the sun, I would probably say. Any ideas what that is? It sounds like when someone's accidentally left the record player on. <laughs> it does. It, it, but I guarantee you wouldn't have guessed what it was just by uh, asking you to, to speculate. That was actually the sound of neurons, brain cells, firing off and talking to each other. And it's been done by a guy called John Donahue because this week he's from Brown University. He's found a way of making an electrode, literally a brain-computer interface. He can insert these electrodes into the brain of an individual. And in this instance, they've put this electrode into the brain of a man who's 25 years old. His name's Matthew, and he's been paralysed for the last few years because of a spinal cord injury. And what the researchers are hoping to do is to record that activity that you just heard and then use a computer to decode it so that Matthew can re-establish the ability to 
move. So using a computer, he can control things in the environment or maybe even in the future get the computer to control the muscles that have been disconnected fr from his brain by the paralysis. So that's what they've done. And this is John Donahue talking about how this research works. The paper is about the technology that we've developed to help a paralyzed person communicate with the outside world again, be able to use their thoughts and from their brain activity to control devices. And mainly what we used was a computer. So is this literally recording from individual nerve fibers, or is this whole populations of nerve cells that you're listening to? We're recording individual nerve cells. We're recording what's called the spiking activity, which is the language of the brain. And we record many of those at once, dozens to more than 100. And we transform the pattern of spiking activity into a single control signal. So in order to record from the hand area of this person's brain, you actually presumably have to implant an electrode. An electrode array is implanted, yes. So what does that look like, and, and how does it work? The array is about the size of a baby aspirin, and it's implanted on the surface. It's 4 by 4 millimeters, and it has 100 hair-like protrusions coming out of it that go just into the surface of the brain. The cortex is about the thick thickness of an orange peel, and the electrodes go about half that thickness into the brain to pick up the neurons that are just below the surface. And then how is that translated by your computer into a meaningful movement? And, and does the subject have to learn to control this? Uh, there's not actually a learning required to control it. The part that has to be learned is the relationship between a complex pattern of activity that's coming out of the brain and a desired motion of the cursor. So we have the patient imagine that they're tracking a cursor on a screen, and by the changes in brain activity that we observe while that patient is observing the cursor motion, we build a map that says, here's the pattern of activity and here's the cursor position. And later on, here's another pattern of activity and here's another cursor position. And we try to map the two together. And, of course, another significant finding is we're able to do that. We do it over a period of about 15 minutes or so. So that's not really learning. It's establishing the mapping function. Once that mapping function is put together into an, uh, in, in the computer, then the patient is able to just think about moving and the cursor will move pretty much in the motion that the hand would take if you were to imagine, say, moving left or right. How accurate are the movements that the person who has the implant fitted can make? So the motion of the cursor by thought is, I describe it as wobbly and unstable. So right now, if your mouse performed like that, it would be rather frustrating. And that's actually been part of our study is to understand what happens as a person is exposed to that kind of signal do they get better and better at controlling it? And so far, we haven't seen a major change in their control. And what that means is that at least we haven't found out how to exploit the brain's plasticity, so we need to change the computer to make the control signal better. And we're doing that and actually having some good success. That was John Donahue from Brown University in the US talking on Nature's podcast about the brain-computer interface he's developed to help people who are paralysed to regain at least some control over their surroundings. The Naked Scientists, supported by the Wellcome Trust. We've had an email in here from Deborah Debris, uh, or it's actually someone called Greg, I'm not sure, perhaps he's using Deborah's email address, who knows. Um, but he says, hello, you just listened to one of the podcasts regarding a common food eaten in Tanzania, and this was Derek's Kitchen Science uh, a week or so ago, where he was looking at how you make ugali in Tanzania, a, a dish made from, from meal that you mix up in water a bit like porridge. And, uh, and Greg says, from your description, it sounds like a pot served as the common food in Togo and another dish called fufu, which uses something called manioc, uh, another sort of meal-based thing, as the base instead of cornmeal. So uh, thanks for that, Greg. Very useful. We've had a call for my teaser this evening, which is how many legs, tentacles, whatever you want to call them, does a squid have? Uh, Les in Overs on the right lines, Joshua in Willingham too, and uh, Norman in Hunstanton says it doesn't have any legs because it does have arms. Well done. If you think you know the answer, 08459 25 2000. We have some great goodies to give away because Kat's brought in from Cancer Research a whole selection of, well, to fit out your wardrobe for summer, basically, Kat. Yeah, you can get some T-shirts, you can get hats and some Frisbees for summer fun because uh, the message from Cancer Research UK is really that it's great to enjoy the sun. However, um, getting sunburned and too much exposure to the sun can really increase your risk of skin cancer. So get out there, have fun, but make sure you keep your T-shirt on, keep your hat on, avoid the hottest sun and uh, don't burn. 
I have sitting next to me on the desk here um, uh, two nice juicy apples which I'm slowly eating during the programme um, and I also have this collection of extremely nice chillies which have been given to me by John Barker so I mustn't actually m- pick up the wrong thing and take a bite without I'm looking I'm waiting for you to do that <laughs> but the reason I have these chillies uh, is because we had last week an email from Kat uh, not, not you Kat obviously and she, she writes under the name uh, United Girl 24 and she was saying I was wondering if you'd tell me why is a chilli called a chilli when it's hot and we said we didn't know well I'm pleased to say uh, Jose Fernandez who is in Mexico City has been listening to us on the internet and he's, he's written to me and said I've been listening to your show for several months now and I must say it's outstanding in the degree of detail and easygoing man you have in presenting it so thank you for that he says now you were wondering why is it called a chilli when it's hot well the name comes actually from the Spanish word chilli just like the country um, which has its own roots respectively in the Nahuatl which uh, in Spain is called Guindia so in other words it's named after the Spanish word where it comes from oh ok Thanks very much. Our, our listeners are a source of fantastic information. We love you all. Anyway, it's time for our weekly trip to the US and hear from Chelsea and Bob uh, with our science update. They're going to talk about frog eggs that literally leg it when a hungry snake slithers by and a robot called Red Owl who can pinpoint the source of gunshots on the battlefield. This week for the Naked Scientists, we'll learn about a technology that mimics human hearing and could help soldiers on the battlefield. But first, in nature, eggs are sitting ducks. But Chelsea learned that some types of eggs may not be as helpless as they seem. It's hard to imagine your breakfast egg running away from a predator, but the eggs of the red-eyed tree frog can do just that. Biologist Karen Workington of Boston University has found that these eggs hatch prematurely when in imminent danger from a snake. And it's a very rapid behavioral response. Snakes start biting, and within uh, seconds to a couple of minutes, the tadpoles will, will bail out. And about... Um, Up to 80% or so can escape from the snakes. But premature tadpoles don't face good odds, so they need to be able to tell a real snake from a false alarm. It's such a big decision for them, and it's, it's a question of, you know, death in one place versus death in another place. Their secret? Workington's experiments show that the eggs use vibrations to distinguish between snakes, wasps, rain, and wind, and are accurate even when the vibrations are similar. Thanks, Chelsea. A robot called Red Owl may soon help soldiers locate the source of gunshots. It's based on sound processing technology originally designed to improve cochlear implants for deaf people. New field tests show that this technology can accurately identify and log the locations of many shots in rapid sequence, like those on a battlefield. Engineer Socrates de la George of Boston University says it's modeled after the way humans and other mammals hear. Basically, neuron by neuron how the mechanical structures take sound pressure waves, convert them to electrical signals, and how the brain uses those electrical signals. Once Red Owl locates the source of the gunshot, it turns to the shooter and zooms in with a camera. And though it could still be a while before Red Owl makes it to actual battlefields, Della George says the sound processing technology has proved useful in many other situations. These include monitoring machinery and even taking a census of frogs. Thanks, Bob. Next time, we'll learn about scientists who are developing replacement retinas that use chemicals to communicate with the brain. Until then, I'm Chelsea Wald. And I'm Bob Hershon for AAAS, the Science Society. Back to you, Naked Scientists. Hey, thanks, Bob. And if you want to hear more science news from the guys at Science Update, then go and check out their website, where you can hear more from Bob and Chelsea. It's www.scienceupdate.com. And we've just had an email through to our website, uh, which is uh, thenakedscientist.com. And it's from a girl called Hannah, who's in Hamburg in Germany. She says, for a start, she loves our British accents, which is great. Uh, And she says she's a future biology student. She loves the show. And it's good to update her English science vocabulary. And she's just voted for us on the podcast awards. So what's this all about, Chris? Well, there's a group in America that have decided to to give awards for the best podcasts internationally, but you need to nominate people. So for the last couple of weeks, they've been collecting and harvesting nominations for various shows all around the world. So hopefully some people out there will have nominated us. The next phase is that those shows which have been selected by the people at Podcast Awards will then decide... Uh, right, the top five in each category will be put to a vote. So then we're going to uh, we're going to ask everyone if you like the Naked Scientist to support us by giving us a few votes on there. But that hasn't been announced yet, so we're kind of hopeful that it will be soon. Stripping down science. Okay, let's do it. The Naked Scientists. Joining us now from the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, which is in uh, near Oxford, uh, is Chris Davis. Hi, Chris. 
Hi. Thank you for joining us on this evening's edition of The Naked Scientist to talk all about the sun. It's something we very much take for granted, isn't it? I remember a mathematics probability textbook I had when I was um, back at school, and it said there are some things in life that are certain, like the sun rising tomorrow. Probability equals one. But what actually <laughs> is the sun, and, and is it always going to rise? Well, it's, a, it's our nearest star. Um, the sun is a, a huge ball of mainly hydrogen gas, um, and it's burning, as you mentioned earlier, this hydrogen uh, by the process of, of nuclear fusion to form helium. And um, it's been, as far as we can tell, burning for the last four and a half billion years and will continue to burn for another four and a half billion years. So that's about as near a probability of one as you can get, I think. Um, it's quite appropriate you said that, um, Chris, because there's an email here from Scott, who's over in the States, he says um, he's enjoying the show very much, but all about the sun. And generally speaking, is it really shrinking at a rate that people should be worried about? Well, it's certainly shrinking in the fact that it's giving off matter into space the whole time. It's known as the solar wind. Um, but this is a tiny, tiny fraction of the mass of the sun. And uh, it's certainly not going to uh, evaporate into space before it uh, uses up all the fuel. I mean, one statistic I did hear was that the sun sheds something like 8 million tonnes a second. Yes, I mean, I think over the course of a, a, the numbers are so big, it's so difficult to equate what they are. But uh, it's about the equivalent of a, a, the mass of a, a you know, reasonable sized mountain a day, basically. Because the, the reason the sun is losing weight, I mean, we might as well talk about the physics of this. It, it comes down to Einstein and E equals m c squared, doesn't it? Well, it certainly is losing weight because it's it's uh, sticking hydrogen atoms together to produce helium atoms, and that releases energy, which, as you say, you can convert energy to to mass using the famous E equals mc squared relation but it's also giving off um, a stream of its atmosphere is, is, is so hot and it's boiling um, it's like if you look at a, a, a saucepan of water boiling there's steam rising from the surface and that's because that those particular um, particles have got enough energy to leave the, 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 the fluid in the saucepan and it's the same with the surface of the sun if you can look at it with a with this cameras special cameras in space on spacecraft you can see it's just a writhing mass it just looks like a, 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 a a pan of rice on the boil, and this can send material into space in a continuous stream known as the solar wind. Now, one statistic I, I did hear, uh, Chris, was that people have said it takes eight minutes for light from the sun to reach the Earth, but then I was speaking to someone from who's actually a professor of astrophysics at another university, and he said that actually the light we're getting out of the sun is already a million years old, and it's been bombarding itself all around inside the sun for a million years before it escapes and makes its way in that eight minutes to Earth. <laughs> That's right, yeah, the eight minutes is not, in, inconsequential. Um, the, the, the light is generated when uh, it's only the centre of the sun that the pressure is great enough and the temperature is great enough to actually produce the nuclear reactions that can fuse hydrogen into helium. And then the light that's given out, uh, it, 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 the material is so dense there that the light that's given out is immediately absorbed by something else and then it's emitted by that and absorbed by something else. It's, a, it's an incredibly large um, game of... Um, uh, so our arcade game where this thing is being ricocheted backwards and forwards around inside the sun and it does take about a million years for that one single photon of light to get from the centre out to the surface where the, the density of the gas uh, de decreases to the extent that the material becomes transparent and it can then shine out into space. Can we talk a little bit about what's actually going on right in the centre of the sun to, to power it? I mean, what is the, the process that's happening in doing that? Well, the centre of the sun, the sun is, is an enormous ball of gas and it's being pulled together under its own gravity, uh, which is then squishing the, the material in the centre to uh, incredible densities uh, that are actually forcing the, the, uh, the, the particles in the, in, the, in, in the soup so close together that they can um, fuse to form... Uh, uh, turn two he uh, helium atoms into a hydrogen atom. And it, it, the temperature is at about 16 million degrees in the centre of the sun. So it, you have to have this huge ball of gas pressing down onto it to generate the sort of conditions necessary. And when you take two atoms and join them together, you release energy, and that's what gives the sun uh, the, the, the light and, and, the, and the heat that it, that it, that it emits. So how do we actually measure stuff about the sun? How do we measure its size and the heat and, and the light that comes out of it? Well, there's lots of observations have been going on um, of the sun for many hundreds of years um, because the sun 
uh, was a was obviously a, a religious uh, object to people like the Aztecs and uh, the Egyptians. So we've got a lot of information about the sun and particularly solar eclipses, and those those tell us about the solar atmosphere, for example, because when the moon moves in front of the sun, it it blocks out that bright disk and allows you to see this the faint solar wind, which is the gas blowing out into space. And so they made observations like that; they were able to predict eclipses. But as we move towards the space age, we can actually start to look at the sun in different wavelengths. And the sun is the colour it is because the surface of the sun is at about 5,800 degrees. And the, that tells us, the, the colour tells us the, the, the temperature, and it's just like a blacksmith in a blacksmith forge. He knows when the metal is at the right temperature because it goes white hot or red hot. or you know, he, can, he uses the colour that the, the hot metal is emitting to tell him what, color, what, what temperature it is. And then how do we study other things about the sun? So what, what exactly are things like solar flares and sunspots, all these weird phenomena that are associated with the sun? Well, the sun is, is like most stars. It actually um, has a magnetic field like the Earth. And that magnetic field uh, in the Earth is, is reasonably stable. We know that it flips up and down every few hundred thousand years. But the sun is a fluid, and it's a fluid that has sort of peculiar properties. The equator of the sun rotates every 25 days, whereas the poles of the sun rotate every 30 days. Because uh, we've, we've got a question in here from uh, Dirk Slowinski, and he says, um, are we any closer to understanding how these geomagnetic fluctuations in the sun affect our climate on Earth? Well, yes, we've come a long way um, with that science later on, uh, recently. And the, and the reason for this is, is that, that the sun has this magnetic field. The magnetic field goes out into space in the solar wind. And uh, that affects planets such as the Earth. We've got a magnetic field. And if you put two magnets together, they either repel or attract, depending on whether they're the same or opposite signs. If the sun's field in space near us is the opposite sign, those two fields can join together and some of this really hot gas that's being given out into space can fall into the Earth's atmosphere and that's what causes what's known as a geomagnetic storm because it, if, you, if you're measuring the, the Earth's magnetic field on the ground, you see your compass needle start to get a bit confused as to what's going on because all the um, magnetic field of the Earth is being um, moved about and um, altered by being connected to the sun's magnetic field. It's absolutely fascinating stuff because you think the sun's so far away, but it's it's still affecting us. But tell us tell us a bit now about what you're actually working on. There's a new mission called Stereo, apparently. What's all this about? Well, that's right. Well, we, we've with uh, the space mess, uh, excuse me, the space missions that we've been launching of late, um, we've started to get a much better detailed view of the surface of the sun and you can get active regions on the surface of the sun where the sun's magnetic field gets contorted and twisted and pops up through the surface of the sun and it's these that uh, cause are the root of solar flares and solar prominences and also um, are the root of a thing called coronal mass ejections which is a, a very violent storm which comes out into space uh, sending um, the, a very dense or well, much more dense clouds of this gas uh, towards us. But the trouble is that we want to try and predict these coronal mass ejections and what direction they're going in and uh, how fast they're travelling and although SOHO has been a very successful mission it's one view in space and it's very difficult to, to deconstruct that convoluted 3D nature. So with the stereo mission, we're going to send two spacecraft out, one ahead of the Earth in the Earth's orbit and one behind the Earth, just inside the Earth's orbit. And after a couple of months, they're going to be far enough apart that they can look back at the sun and actually view the surface of the sun in three dimensions and try and work out this complicated twist of spaghetti loops that you can see coming out of the surface. It's Chris Davis from the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in Oxford. He's here for the entire show. If you'd like to ask him any questions about the sun and how it works, just call now, 08459 25 2000. Send in a text message, 07786 20 1960. Or you can email chris at nakedscientist.com. In a second, we'll be talking to David, who's in Tillingham, and also waiting in the wings. You've, you've already heard him sort of chipping in along the programme. Geoffrey Lewins from Cambridge University is going to get a bit more into the nuclear argument. The sun's a massive nuclear reactor. Can we build one on Earth? Should we build a fusion reactor on Earth? How long into the future will it be before we can? The Naked Scientist podcast, brought to you by thenakedscientist.com. It's The Naked Scientist with Dr Chris and Dr Katz. We're going to have a quick chat now to Geoffrey Lewins from Cambridge University before we go to David, who's in Tillingham, who has a question for us all about the moon. First of all, Geoffrey, uh, thank you very much for coming in and talking to us. Pleasure. Um, nuclear power has had a mixed reception from the public and certainly a, quite a hostile reception this week in the wake of the government's publication of what they think should happen. 
on the nuclear debate. But first of all, what actually is nuclear power? How does it work? And what's the future? Well, of course, we've heard about the fusion going on in the sun, and that's that great nuclear reactor in the sky. The, uh, the light and the, and the heat we get from the sun is essential to the Earth already. Um, you could uh, hope to build a fusion reactor on Earth, but it's a real problem because we don't have the mass of the sun, the, build, the gravity to make it work. We have to substitute a magnetic field, and uh, that's expensive. It's, it's great science, it's challenging engineering, but I think, having been in the business for 50 years, I'd still say success is 50 years away, if you mean by success, getting useful electricity back from fusion power. Now, the other end from what David said is fission power. In the sun, they're putting very light elements together and uh, getting energy out of it, but here on Earth, we've got heavy elements like uranium and thorium. And if you split those up into fission products, you also get neutrons left over, uh, these things that cause the fission in the first place, and energy. And it's that energy that for the last 50 years people have employed. Of course, some in weapons, and we don't want to see that, but some uh, employed in nuclear power stations to produce electricity, which we have a substantial amount in this country and other places in the world. Got an email here from Max Ferretti, who's listening from New College in Florida, and he confesses in his email that they stole the name of their college from New College in Oxford, by the way. So this is a <laughs> neurobiologist and likes listening to us in his lab. But he says, what's the deal with fusion as a power source? Is it going to ever really be economically possible? And is cold fusion the answer, or a pipe dream? So what actually is that? Well, let's start with cold fusion. Uh, this was reported, or it must be 15 or more years ago, as an interesting product where you didn't need big uh, magnetic fields, but you had electric currents passed into liquids, and then somehow, suddenly, they gave energy off. Whether this is really fusion or whether it's just one of the funny things about ele electricity and batteries and so forth, I don't think has been fully demonstrated yet. But if you want to go to the more general idea of of fusion as it is on the sun, I think you have to say that on Earth we've been able to demonstrate fusion for a few fractions of a second, a few milliseconds. We've never got uh, electricity out of it. We've always put a lot of electricity into it. And um, I think it's a very challenging thing that we haven't cracked it. The secret is still there, unlike fission uh, energy, we don't know for sure that it ever will work. But, but why is fusion viewed as better than fission? Um, perhaps because it's 50 years further down the line, is, is one answer. But it m doesn't produce the uh, associated material such as plutonium, which comes out of uh, fission reactors when uranium is converted into plutonium. Plutonium can be burned in fission reactors, but it's also one of the routes into nuclear weapons, and I think there's a, a concern there. But to be fair, fusion energy produces a lot of neutrons, it produces a lot of radioactivity, and don't think it's the clean thing that some people would like you to think it is. Nuclear power is very controversial, and actually over the past um, nine weeks or so, I've been involved in writing a blog uh, online for the Institute of Physics, which is looking at all the issues surrounding nuclear power, particularly in the light of the UK's energy review. And um, so you can go and have a look yourself, find out all the arguments, and it's at www.potentialenergy.iop.org. And it's looking into the science, the politics, the economics of it. So go along, have a look, and make your own comments. This is The Naked Scientist with Chris Smith and Kat Arney, and uh, we're talking this evening about the science of the sun and the science of nuclear activity. Geoffrey Lewin's there from Cambridge University. If you'd like to join in tonight's show, 08459 25 2000 is our phone number. You can email chris at nakedscientist.com or you can send us a text on 07786 20 1960. Now, we couldn't have a show about the sun without at least talking sunburn. And Derek and Dave have gone out to Hinchingbrook to find out how sun cream works. Hi, Derek. Hello there. Welcome this week to Hinchingbrook School, where we've come to do a fantastic and very summer-themed experiment. And, of course, with me is Dave, fellow naked scientist. So, Dave, what are we actually going to be doing this week? Well, we're going to be finding out how sun cream works and what it's doing. OK, thanks, Dave. And also, we've got a couple of volunteers from Hinchingbrook School who are going to be helping us out. So could you just give me your names and what year you're in, please? I'm Rob. I'm in Year 12. I'm Spencer, and I'm in Year 12 as well. OK, and it's always good to find out whether you guys are into science and you're doing science. What about you, Rob? Uh, yes, I'm into science. I'm doing physics A-level at the moment. OK, and yourself, Spencer? 
Uh, same as me, I'm also studying AS Physics with Rob. OK, and is science the best thing that anyone can do at school ever? Probably, yeah. All right, yeah, we like, that's, a, that's a tactful answer there. OK, thank you very much. Right, so then, Dave, what we have in front of us is... Well, why don't you explain it? What are we going to do first? Well, we've got a sort of black box, and inside the black box is a sort of purpley light going on, OK? OK, so, yeah, in, in front of us in the lab in Hinchingbrook School, we've got this kind of black box on the lab bench, and, yeah, there's a kind of a purple light in there that we can just about see. So what are we going to do with it? Well, first of all, Spencer, could you take these washing powder tablets and chuck them in under the light and see what happens? OK, then. Right, Spencer, tell us what you can see. They're basically two kind of white, round tablets of washing up powder. What can you see? I think you can see the crystals inside, that they're, they're all blue compared to the, the white tablet. What do you think, Rob? I mean, any idea what's going on there? I think certain parts of the tablet are kind of glowing blue more than other parts of the tablet. Yeah. What do you say, Dave? Uh, maybe you'd like to compare it to this piece of white paper. Just chuck some normal piece of white paper in there. OK, and what does that look like, Rob? It looks like the glowing part of the blue part of the crystal. Yeah, OK, so again, we've got this white, which goes under the, uh, the purple light we've got here, and the white paper actually kind of glows blue. OK, what's happening is that people who make washing powder and paper cheat. OK, they can't make washing powder clean your clothes to make them really white. So what they do is they put a special substance in there, which take a kind of light, which is called ultraviolet. It's like beyond violet in, in a rainbow. You can't see it, it's invisible but it's there from the sun, and they convert it into a kind of glow, a blue glow. And that's the reason why people's clothes glow when they go into a disco or something. OK, then. now, we should, of course, explain, therefore, that this light we've got here in this box is ultraviolet, is it? That's right, yes. OK, Dave, but why is it that we're actually seeing a blue colour when it's under the UV and not, you know, some other colour? It all depends on the actual molecular structure of the substance we've got under there. The way they work is the ultraviolet light's got lots and lots of energy. It hits one of the molecules, it absorbs the energy, and some of it gets lost and some of it gets emitted again as a colour, as a less energetic light, which is a colour we can see. OK, and where, yeah, you mentioned discos. I mean, where do people kind of see ultraviolet light or where may they have seen it? Well, the, the glowing effect they use in discos to make people's clothes look more exciting and also when people test banknotes, are they actually putting them under ultraviolet light and seeing whether they glow or not? Now then, what are we going to do next? What have we got? Well, Rob, I don't suppose you could draw some interesting patterns in these day-glow pens on the back of your hand. So we've got some kind of day-glow pens here. Rob's got a pink one. Um, Spencer, why don't you take that yellow one? And uh, what have you drawn there? It looks very abstract. It's a little face. Ah, I like it. OK. I didn't spot that, I must say, but uh, there we go. And uh, yourself, Spencer? I have a little face as well. OK, with the tongue hanging out. That's absolutely brilliant. OK, um, and now what, what do they do with that? If you'd like to take your hands and just put them under the light. OK, and tell us what you see. Rob, firstly. Uh, mine's glowing like a brighter orange. OK, then. And yourself over there, Spencer? Uh, it's gone from really light yellow to really bright green. Yeah, OK. So it's, it's, they're pretty bright, really. They're, they're much, much brighter underneath that UV light. So, yeah, day glow pens also convert ultraviolet light into a colour which you can see, um, sometimes red, sometimes green, all sorts of different colours. That's why they're called day glow. They don't glow so well um, under a normal incandescent bulb because there's very little ultraviolet there, which is why they're called day glow, because they don't work very well at night. OK, so by incandescent, you just mean like a standard, you know, 60 watt, 100 watt light bulb that you might have in your living room. But under the sun, uh, they do glow very well. OK, but what are we going to do now? Well, now, we'd like you to take some sun cream and put it over half of your pattern. Yeah, so we've brought some sun cream in here, and um, just over half of uh, the, the, the faces that they've drawn, Rob and Spencer are actually kind of pasting it on there. Very good. OK, guys, you can go out and get a great tan now. But what we actually want you to do is put those back under the UV. So uh, do so and tell us what you see. The half that has sun cream on isn't reflecting as brightly as the half that doesn't. OK, Rob, so why do you think then that, that you're not seeing the, uh, the bit that's got the sun cream paste on it? Why is that not glowing under the UV as much? Well, I guess because sun cream must reflect UV light. All right. OK, how does that sound, Dave? Yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, rather reassuringly, the sun cream is stopping the ultraviolet light because the ultraviolet light is what gives you sunburn. And so sun cream stops you getting sunburned, so it stops the ultraviolet light. It doesn't necessarily reflect it. Sometimes some of them reflect it, some of them just absorb it. But basically it just stops it. OK, that's fantastic. The thing is, though, you could kind of see a bit of colour under there still. So, I mean, does it work 100% or is it not completely effective? Well, this, the factor on your sun cream is how much it reduces the ultraviolet by. So a factor 15 will reduce it by a factor of 15. Because your eyes are still quite sensitive, you can still see the little bit of glow from that getting through. Now, doing this without a UV light is probably very difficult, but is this something people can kind of see the effect of at home? If you put a bit of sun cream over a day glow pen inside under a normal light bulb and then take it outside, you might be able to see a bit of a difference. 
OK, then. So maybe if you want to try it, then you could try, you know, using a Dayglow pen, draw a pattern, and then put some sun cream over half of it and, you know, see what you get under different lights. Or, indeed, if you're going down the disco, then uh, just go prepared. You know, draw yourself a little shape on your hand and put some sun cream on it. You know, it's the new style. Great. OK, then. Right. Well, that's the end of the experiment. So thanks very much to Robin Spencer. Spencer, how did you like it? I thought it was pretty good. Nice to see that uh, sun cream actually works. Yeah. OK, then. And, Rob, I mean, does this, yeah, reassure you that, you know, you can go out and get a great tan now? Uh, yes, probably. OK. <laughs> Superb. All right, then. And uh, that's all from Hinchingbrook School. So uh, we'll be back next week with more kitchen science from somewhere in the east of England. So until then, it's goodbye. Thank you very much, Derek, Dave, Rob and Spencer, who are out there at Hinchingbrook School. Next week, in fact, Derek will be in Suffolk finding out about vacuums and pitching his strength against the Earth's atmosphere. Stripping down science. OK, let's do it. The Naked Scientists. You're listening to The Naked Scientist with Dr Chris, Dr Kat, and we're talking about the sun and all aspects of it. And we've got David, who's got a question. Hello, David. Hello. How are you? What's your question well, for us? I suppose my question, that, that was interesting. My granny used to put a dye in her final white what, rinse called Reckitt's Blue. Ah, to made, make it nice and... Made the, made the whites look very uh, white in sunlight. Oh, there you go. Yeah, it was a sort of powder thing in a little in a little bag, like a tea bag. Oh, brilliant. OK. Uh, now, my, I knew this was coming up because I've heard the trail on it. Sitting in my kitchen, which faces uh, south, uh, west, I beg your pardon, this morning, after 10 o'clock, the sun is well up in the sky, really high, and from my kitchen window, over the roofs of the houses opposite, I could see the moon, and it still had a shadow on it, and I, I couldn't understand how, if I could see the full disk of the sun from Earth and see the moon from Earth, where did the shadow come from? Well, the, the reason for that, David, is that the shadow you're seeing is the earth, it's the edge of the earth. Um, and so because one isn't completely in line with the other, you don't get a perfect circle of the moon. Uh, let's ask Chris. Hi, Chris. Hello. What do you think? Well, it, it's just that. You're, you're looking at the moon, which is 240,000 kilometres away, and uh, you're, you're sort of... From your advantage point, you can sort of just peer around to the, the dark side. It's like if you were... We're, we're sat on the sunward side of the, of the planet, uh, and if you uh, look across at a planet that's sort of the, more or less the same distance from you, you can just sort of perhaps peek around behind the, the, the dark side of it. Yeah. Quick go at the quiz, David. Well, what's the prize, then? You can win some T-shirts, some hats, some Frisbees from Cancer Research UK. Oh, yeah, UK. Frisbee would be great, Frisbees. wouldn't it? Frisbees. <laughs> Frisbees already. I'll have a go, yeah. All right. Well, no, just, a, just a quick one, then. It says here, in 1992, 2,500 Americans were hospitalised by houseplants. Do you think that's science fact or one I made up earlier? Oh, probably true. You're absolutely right, yes. 2,500 Americans ended up in ER um, in 1992 as a result of accidents with houseplants. Intriguingly, in the same year, 5,800 ended up in hospital because of mishaps involving pillows, though it doesn't say if it's the same ER that featured George Clooney. I don't know, pillow-related mishaps. Europe is the only continent without a desert. Fact or fiction? Uh, well, Europe. Oh, I'm going to say fiction. I know it's wrong. Yeah, it was in last week's show, actually. It was our, our trivia question last Toby, week. I suppose, is it? Oh, well, oh no, what's... Oh, sorry. We don't have a desert we in Europe. We have no deserts in Europe. Bad luck. Sorry, David. We might send you a prize anyway. We've got loads. You can it, have it a frisbee. A, it was a good question. It was really good to have you on the show. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. Margaret is in Chelmsford. Hello, Margaret. Hello there. What's your question? Um, this has been a question that's been puzzling me for quite some time, actually. Quite a few years, so this is a bit sad, really. Um, I've been in nursing 40 mm -mm years, which I'm not going to say. <laughs> and when I was doing my training, we were, it was drummed into us, amongst other things, that vitamin D comes from the sun. Well, if we're all sort of neurotic about putting sunblocks on, Will we not have a lot of people suffering from SAD? Yeah, this is, this is a really interesting debate and there's some people in the media who are sort of saying, oh, we all need to get out in the sun as much as possible. And it's very difficult because being exposed to too much sun, uh, particularly burning, really does increase your risk of skin cancer. We know this from research and rates of skin cancer are set to treble in the UK as a result of too much sun exposure. But we do make vitamin D in our skin when the sunlight hits our skin. 
and we can also get vitamin D in our diet. And vitamin D is really important for building healthy bones uh, and teeth and things like that. And a deficiency of vitamin D can cause rickets. And there's some evidence that vitamin D may protect people against cancer and be very important for health. Mm. So it's it's a difficult message to try and get across, is that, yes, it's important to um, be very safe in the sun and not to burn, and particularly not to let children burn in the sun, mm. because that can really increase their risk of cancer later in life. 100% percent increase if burned before Absolutely. the age of 15, isn't it? Absolutely. It's really important not to let children get sunburnt. Mm. But at the same time, you know, you can just avoid the very hottest parts of the day. At Cancer Research UK now, we have our SunSmart code, which is about just getting out of the really hot time of the day around about noon. Mm. Then, you know, wear a T-shirt, put on a bit of sun cream, wear your hat, you know, make sure you're using Factor 15 sun cream. But you will still get enough sun to absolutely keep your um, your levels of vitamin D healthy. Now, what, one point, Margaret, that you mentioned was you're worried about SAD. Now, that's actually something different. That's seasonal affective disorder, which is a certain subset of the population get very depressed if they don't get enough exposure to natural bright sunlight. Right. It's not the same as the risk of getting a lack of vitamin D or overexposure to the sun or underexposure to the sun. Um, it's, a, it's a slightly different phenomenon, but, but I understand what you're getting at. Because Do you want a quick go at the quiz? Go on, then. Uh, you can calculate the distance to the horizon in miles by multiplying 1.22 by the square root of the height of your eyes <laughs> above the ground. Fact or fiction? <laughs> oh, I've got to say it's fact. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Yes, if you need a, a rough and ready estimate of the distance to the horizon, if you're ever lost hiking, uh, in miles, just work out the square root of your height of your eyes above the ground. <laughs> Multiply the result by 1.22 if you carry a calculator while you're hiking. You mean you can't do that? <laughs> no, I haven't even got O-levels in maths. OK, next question, Margaret. I left before O-levels were introduced as, as mandatory. <laughs> I hope you weren't working out people's doses in hospital. <laughs> that the human fingernail grows at about four centimetres per year. Fact or fiction? Four centimetres? Oh, I'd have said that was more than fi- uh, fa- uh, fi- fiction. <laughs> Sadly not, no. Your fingernails grow by about 0.8 millimetres per week, which works out as four centimetres per year. And the longest nails in history, apparently in the world, were owned by the Indian Sridhar Chilal from Pune near Bombay. Oh, Mumbai it is now, whose four-foot-long talons have entered the record books. Sorting out the sparks from the quarks, the Naked Scientists. For more information, get online at nakedscientists.com. Dr Chris and Dr Katz with this week's edition of The Naked Scientist and we're joined by Chris Davis from the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory and Geoffrey Lewins from Cambridge University and in a second we'll be joined by Anna Nicoleo uh, and she's from the University of Bradford and she's going to talk about uh, why it is that some people tan and some people burn but before then Chris got a couple of questions for you here okay. uh, this is from Alan Hughes who's in Worcestershire and he says I have a question about the electromagnetic spectrum radiated from the sun I know there's a wide range of frequencies in the spectrum but exactly how many discrete frequencies are there and what determines the frequency radiated? Well, the, the light that comes from the sun would, would be in a continuous spectrum, and it's dictated by the temperature of the, of the sun. As I was saying earlier, the, the colour tells you what, uh, what temperature it is. And, and for the, uh, the sun's photosphere, um, the wavelengths of light go from uh, X-rays right the way through, up to, through visible light up to um, radio waves, but they peak at around uh, 500 and 50 nanometers, which is which is red light, so that it peaks in the in the visible side of the spectrum, and that would be continuous, were it not for the fact that uh, there are discrete uh, energies that uh, are absorbed and emitted by the various different uh, atomic species on the sun. And for example, the element helium was discovered by. Uh, uh, astronomers noticing that there was a gap in the spectrum that corresponded to an absorption by an element that they previously didn't know about. So they called it helium after the Greek god Helios. Got a question for you, Geoffrey. This has come from Ryan Petty, who's listening in Alberta in Canada. Uh, he says, it's my understanding you can send electricity wirelessly, though microwaves are apparently the best way. Even radio waves contain small traces of electricity. So if the sun emits a huge and powerful spectrum of uh, radio waves and other kinds of electromagnetic waves, um, would it not be possible to just pick up this free energy using a big antenna? Yes, I, I wish it was. Um, the total energy we get... Uh in every square meter or about a square yard on the surface of the earth from the sun is about one kilowatt if we could turn all that into electricity that would be marvelous but i'm afraid the laws of thermodynamics stop that um, uh, uh, the temperature of the sun isn't uh, uh, so great as to turn it all into possible work an antenna would just pick up very faint signals like the old early radio waves when you had a, a crystal set and there was a tiny little signal there um, I'm afraid it isn't going to be 
useful to try and turn that into practical energy to power your house. Uh, we've had a quick question here from Vijay Sani, and he says, how does light actually propagate? Um, he knows there are perpendicular electrical and magnetic fields, um, and they can induce other fields in space, and this keeps going on, so light travels. Is this a, uh, correct? Is there any difference between these electromagnetic fields? What do you think, Chris? Oh, that's come to me, right? OK. <laughs> <laughs> light, how does it work? Well, it's indeed it's one, of those, one of those mysteries, but light can travel through a vacuum. It doesn't require anything to sort of... Uh, push it forward with and you can think of light in terms of, of, of particles as well as photons of light uh, and uh, they, they, can, they can propagate just d down to their, their initial energy. Very quick one because uh, we've got about a minute Chris um, or, or Jeffrey whoever wants to have a go at this is from Charles Passion who's in Honolulu in uh, Hawaii and he says I know it's pretty stupid but does the sun move and uh, what impact could this, the movement of the sun and changes in its velocity have on things like other planets? Well, I think this is one for Chris as the astrophysicist. <laughs> <laughs> OK, okay. here we go. Um, well, the sun does move. We're, we're uh, orbiting our galaxy. We're out on, the, on one of the spiral arms of the galaxy. We go round about every 240 million years. Um, so our whole solar system is moving. But relative to the solar system, it sits at the centre of the solar system. And it is, it is so massive that uh, it controls the movements of the planets. It's the mass of the sun that sets the orbits of the planets up. There's one very quick question here, which is from John Miller, which I doubt neither of you would want to answer, which is, why do you, why do you sneeze when you look at the sun? <laughs> <laughs> I can actually tell you the answer to this. It's not as flippant as it sounds. Um, this is a reflex called the photic sneeze reflex, and no-one's exactly sure what underlies it, but we know it's genetic. It seems to be passed on in families, and about one person in four to one person in five is affected. Uh, th people used to think it was because when you looked at the sun, bright lights made your eyes water, the watering ran down into the nose, it tickled your nose, and that made you sneeze not true because it happens too fast and what scientists think is that there's some sort of crossed wiring in the back of the brain where the pupil con is controlled the size of your pupil and that's what causes that to happen it is the naked scientists which is chris and kat and we're into about the last five minutes of the program but we have a very important topic to discuss now which is the science of sunburn and anna lickalows here from uh, the university of bradford hi anna hello hi. thank you for joining us thank what actually in a nutshell is sunburn what is sunburn is Damage to the skin to the extent that you overwhelm, in a sense, the natural defense of the skin. At the same way, you get burned if you go very close to a naked flame or a very, very hot hob and you get burned. The same way, if you expose yourself to radiation from the sun that has a lot of energy, you get a sunburn. Because it's, it's all down to UV, isn't it? So what's the difference between people here, you know, I hear people talking about UVA and UVB and even UVC. So what is that? Um... The sun uh, sends down to us different types of energy uh, in uh, different forms of radiation. We're quite lucky that the atmosphere blocks the most dangerous one, the UV radiation C. But UV radiation B travels through the atmosphere. It carries quite a lot of energy, and mainly it causes sunburn and gives cancer eventually. So when the UV hits our skin, what's it actually doing to provoke burning and subsequent skin cancer? Uh, it stimulates a natural process, a natural defense of our system that is called inflammation to start with. All this redness you get and the pain and sometimes swelling and feeling really uncomfortable. Or, I don't know if you have noticed, if you stay on the sun for many, many hours, you may even run a fever. This is a result of inflammation. Your body is trying to compensate for this damage that has happened to the skin. This is called inflammation and the redness and everything that comes with it are the classic, classic symptoms. And this is how we exhibit sunburn to start with. Are some people more prone than others, Anna? It is indeed, and we don't quite know why is that. I mean, we know a few things. We know that some people tan and some people burn. We know some people, uh, if they stay for half an hour in the sun, the next day they'll have a nice brownish colour. Some people will be red like a tomato. And it's all down to the natural ability of our skin to produce a dye that is called melanin. This is produced by some type of cells that are called melanocytes that we all have normally on our skin, but in some of us they give a nice pigment and we brown and we tan. In some of us they don't seem to be doing the same job and we get more burn, we get red, we get more inflamed. And we still quite don't know... What is it that makes these 
cells, the melanocytes, behave differently from person to person. Now, your research is looking at specifically prostaglandins. What are they and what's their role in this? Okay, the prostaglandins are some small compounds that our system is producing to show inflammation. To give you an example, you have a headache, you exhibit pain. It's because inflammation is happening. Uh, so you have an aspirin, for example, and you block this. So prostaglandins are these naturally occurring compounds that show inflammation, make you feel bad. And this is what we're trying to relate to the melanocyte. So we're just in the last sort of 15 to 20 se- excuse me, seconds, Anna, yes. um, what about aspirin and things? What's your research actually going to hopefully achieve? Uh, hopefully we'll be able to see, to understand why some people burn uh, instead of tanning, and we would like to develop eventually a drug or a therapy, something like aspirin, that people can take and stop this redness to occur straight away or give them some advice to prevent them from getting in this painful situation. That's Anna Nicolau from the University of Bradford. Thank you very much, Anna. You've been listening to The Naked Scientist with Dr Chris and Dr Kat. Next time, we'll be getting into the holiday spirit and looking at the ocean, fish, and, of course, the swimmer and surfer's worst enemy, which is sharks. Dan LaFoley from English Nature will be here to talk about marine protected areas. Chris Lynham from the University of St Andrews will be here to talk about a jellyfish explosion on the coast of Namibia. And Bruce Wright will be talking live from Alaska about the risky world of tracking sharks. So if you have any questions for us about the wonderful world of marine biology or any general questions or comments about the show, then please do email them to me at chris at thenakedscientist.com. In the meantime, have a great week. Thanks for listening. And until next time, goodbye. Oh, and if you didn't know, a squid, of course, has ten legs. The Naked Scientist podcast, powered by UK Fast, the UK's best hosting provider, on the web at ukfast.net.